the church planning process. Some of you guys might be like, what does that mean exactly? And this is just a really helpful uh, graphic. It was helpful for me when I kind of started the process of what that looks like. Uh, so this comes from Mission 1618, which is a uh, ministry, sort of a ministry of hope. It's also sort of a church planning network. Um, it's kind of like LDI where it's created and funded by Hope, but it also kind of functions as its own ministry. Uh, so if you've never heard of it, that's probably why. Uh, and so they put together this graphic of just kind of showing where you could be in the process of church planning, because it's a long process, longer than I, than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, so pre-assessment is just kind of when you're thinking like, hey, I might want to plant a church. And then the assessment, uh, Joel and I actually just went to in April, so we went down to Chicago uh, for a week and were assessed with Converge, which is the Baptist Church Planning Network. And so they have you do a bunch of ministry exercises, you know, Joel gave a, a mini sermon, we presented kind of our vision for ministry, uh, we had to do a lot of like small group team building type exercises where they watched us to see how you interacted with all of the other uh, couples that were there. I kind of felt like I was on a reality show where like they're all watching you all the time. Like, oh. uh, but it was a really good experience and um, we learned a lot from being there. Uh, and so then there's a kind of this middle part kind of goes in a circle because it, it depends on who you are and what you're doing, how long that process takes. So we're in the planning stages, um, and then that kind of moves from implementation to accountability and all over again. So that's just as we plan, we are, uh, we'll hopefully be with hope walking through that process and we'll be holding us accountable to that and helping us develop those things. So. That's a little bit of us. That's why I'm really excited to talk about church planning. Uh, like Nathan, I don't, I've never planted a church, so I'm not an expert, uh, but I am really excited about it, and I'm looking forward to sharing some of the reasons I'm excited about it with all of you tonight. So, um, kind of an overview, similar to what Nathan said. I'm going to talk a little bit about biblical basis. Since you guys got a lot of that already, I'll try and I'll keep mine a little bit shorter. I'm just going to share a lot of the things that really convinced me of church planning, the things that were compelling to me and why I decided to consider it. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the practical need. So for those of you who are very practical people, this will be hopefully be helpful for you. Uh, and then the last part, I just wanted to try and bring it in and make it really applicable for you guys. Um, I think there... I, I like the idea of both uh, talking about global and local church planning because it shows how God has gifted people and created people to um, be interested in different things, have hearts for different things, and have talents for different things. And so you might be sitting here thinking, you know, I really i am excited about global missions and now I really want to get into that. Or maybe you'll think, I really want to go out the church plant someday uh, locally. Or maybe you're not thinking either of those things. And so I want to bring it into like, what does that mean for you guys then? If you're not called to do that, you don't feel like that's your gifting or your wiring, what does that look like? So I'm going to try and get really practical at the end of it. Um, so biblical basis. This is a little uh, test for you guys. And those of you who are in trek to going through Ephesians right now, you're not allowed to participate. Uh, but this is a, a verse from Ephesians, verse, uh, chapter 3, 8 through 11. And I'm going to read it, and I want to see if you can fill in the blank. So, it says, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's peoples, this grace was given, to, given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the... Church, Jesus. <laughs> I, yeah, and so the reason I ask this is... Uh, I think my instinct is to put in the word like gospel or Jesus here, right? But then you're right. The answer is it's through the church. So it says that his intent was now that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the first time I really thought about that, it really impacted me. Uh, it really kind of highlighted for me the importance of the church um, and why I think... You know, we come to church, I grew up going to a church, uh, so it was kind of this like thing you do as a cultural thing. And so when I first read this verse and really noticed that that's what it was, um, it really made me stop and think like, wow, okay, God has this 
big plan, and the church is a really integral part of it. Um, and so <clears throat> as I continue to think about that and thinking about, okay, then what is church planting? How does that kind of all fit in there? Uh, this is a definition of church planting that comes from a book called Global Church Planting that I would highly recommend if you're interested in the subject at all. Um, but it says that church planting is the ministry of proclaiming the gospel and forming kingdom communities among every tribe, tongue, and people to glorify God in eternity. So I think that really like ties in a lot of the verses that Nathan talked about um, and gives kind of a, a definition to what church planting is. It's the proclaiming the gospel and forming kingdom communities and this idea that it is with everybody, like Nathan talked about. Um, and so in thinking through that, uh, we already talked a little bit about the Great Commission. We already read these verses. Um, but I'm going to read them again and just kind of highlight another side of it. So it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So we talked about this part already, right? The importance of that it's all nations, it's all people. Um, and I think I always, when I think of the Great Commission, I always think of that part, right? Then go and make disciples. That's the part that kind of comes to my mind. Um, and I, I kind of like push this next part aside, the baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Um, and I think I kind of pushed it to the side because I was always like, how does the baptism part fit in? I'm not totally sure. I don't necessarily believe that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. So how, you know, how does this work? Um, and the thing that, the more I studied it and the more I thought about church planning, uh, I realized that this baptizing part of it had a lot of connection to the community aspect. So remember that definition said that it was forming communities. Um, and in, you see in the scripture and in the early church that when people were baptized, it was this public proclamation of faith, which we would agree to, but it was also this inclusion into a community into a believing community that was growing and um, active in their faith into a church, you could say. Um, and so an example of that is uh, Acts 2. So if you guys remember the story, uh, in the beginning of the chapter 2, Peter goes and he preaches the gospel to the crowds. Uh, and this is the, the time, because he does that a lot in Acts, this is the time when the people respond and they say that they feel cut to the heart. If you remember this, they say, we feel cut to the heart. Now what do we do? They have this response to the gospel. They, the Holy Spirit's moving in them, they feel this, and they say, now what? What do we do? And Peter's reply is, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And so that's, you know, we would say, yeah, thumbs up, we agree with that. And it says that those who, were, who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And so I think we kind of compartmentalize this story and then the story that comes after it into two different things. At least I do. And I know that my uh, Bible likes to put a heading right in the middle of it, which doesn't always <laughs> help with the compartmentalizing part of it. But right after he talks about that these believers were baptized, the next thing is this uh, description of I think the thing we think of often when we think, what is the early church like? We go to this passage, right? It says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And each day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So the reason I, I go through Acts 2 is just to highlight that connection between this idea of hearing the gospel, being baptized, and coming together to form a community. Um, and that's what it, we're talking about in terms of church planting. How are we forming these communities together um, to proclaim God's name? So those are some of the scripture passages that really hit me uh, about church planning. It really kind of convinced me to consider it as something that is important in our faith and in our beliefs. Uh, so, like Nathan said, there's so many different verses in scripture that you could go to, and he listed off a lot of them. But those are just a few that really uh, spoke to me. Uh, and I have a quote here that kind of talks about that connection between you know, evangelism, being baptized, and forming communities. It's from Center Church, uh, but I think it's from a chapter that you guys didn't read for the homework. So it says, 
In Acts, planting churches is not a traumatic or an unnatural event. It is woven into the warp and woof of ministry, which I had never heard that expression. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that. Uh, so I Googled it, and this is what showed up. This is this little image up here. Apparently it was like a, a weaving loom type of a thing. And so the warp was the, the vertical thing, and the woof was the horizontal thing. So it had to kind of go, like, be woven in between them. So I think what Keller's trying to get at is that it's woven into the fabric of it. <laughs> it would have been an easier way to say it. But, uh, and so he says, and so it happens steadily and normally. Paul never evangelizes and disciples without also planting a church. So just seeing this connection between how they work together, um, you know, like I said in the Great Commission, it's not just go and make disciples and then, you know, leave them there, but it's make disciples and then baptize them and bring them into the community. Um, and so that really kind of helped me get excited about church planting. Uh, and so I was trying to think of an example of what's something that's uh, similar to this, and you're probably looking at the screen thinking, I have no idea where she's going with this. But I was thinking about how, um, what's something that's so connected that you would, it would be silly to do one thing and not the other. And I was thinking about like, you know, you pay association fees for clubs or something, but none of us are really, we don't do like the Lions Club. That was something that like my parents did growing up or whatever. So I was trying to think like, what's a modern example? And the only thing I could think of was like a, a sports team or a, um, a class that you might pay to join. So like, you know, like the Hope softball team, you pay to join and then you play all summer. Um, it's a fun fact about me, I take ballet classes at the St. Paul Ballet. So I pay for these classes and then I go and take the classes, right? So I think they're, they're trying to say like, evangelizing without then like bringing them into a church is like paying for this, group or this club or this sport and then never actually showing up for any of the things you pay for. It just doesn't make any sense. You have to put them both together. And so just again, this idea that it's woven together, they are, they're inseparable there. Um, and another quote from Keller, it says, much traditional evangelism aims to get at a decision for Christ. Experience, however, shows us that many of these decisions disappear and never result in changed lives. Why? Many, many decisions are not really con conversions, but often only the beginning of a journey of seeking God. Other decisions are very definitely the moment of a new birth, but this differs from person to person. So sometimes that happens, right? Hap you're converted on the spot. But for a lot of people, it's just the first step. And so he says, only a person who's being evangelized in the context of an ongoing worshiping and shepherding community can be sure of finally coming home into vital saving faith. So again, just this importance of not just trying to evangelize to get people to make a commitment or to say yes, but to actually, you know, get them to change their lives and to join this community um, and hopefully to join the church. And so for me, this really helps kind of like make everything all fit together. So we showed this cycle earlier, and it talks about the evangelize, equip, and empower. And so once I started to realize that, you know, the first two sections really went hand in hand, the evangelism and the equipping. So you're, you know, evangelizing to these people and bringing them into a community to, you know, disciple them, to help teach them the words of Jesus. Um, I realized that those two had to connect. And then the more I thought about it logically, you know, you're developing leaders, you're raising these people up to do what? You know, like, what, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? And that's really where the whole thing started to click and the whole circle started to fit for me is that you're raising them up to go out and start the cycle over again, to go out and reach new people. Um, and while some people can stay within the church and do that, there's also this, some people who go out and do that, whether they're going out globally to reach new people or they're going out in the city to do that. And so just this idea that it all fits together, I think it can be really easy to try and compartmentalize them uh, and to kind of step back and see the big picture of what is God doing uh, with all these different pieces and all these different parts together. So that's kind of that, that Pauline cycle. Um, if you want to look, look closely, they give kind of examples of different places that that happens in scripture, so you could look that up online. Just Google it and it'll pop up. But that's how it clicked for me, is just seeing how all of these pieces fit together. So that's the kind of the biblical basis of it. And so now I want to get into some of the practical reasons. And some of these you'll find in Center Church if you did the reading. Uh, but just wanted to take some time to expand on it and talk about it a little bit. So. There's four different reasons that I kind of uh, chose to talk about. 
And one of them is that it, it reaches new people for Christ. Um, and there's a, a quote or a statistic from Center Church uh, that says that studies confirm that the average new church gains one third to two third thirds of its new members from the ranks of people who are not attending any worshiping body. So the average new congregation then will bring new people into the life of the body at six to eight times the rate of an older congregation of the same size. So this is the idea that like these new churches that start, they actually tend to grab most of the people that come into them from people who are not already attending churches, who maybe don't already know the gospel. Uh, whereas as a church gets older, statistically, it tends to draw more people from uh, existing churches. So as a church grows in age, it tends to bring in more people who are just kind of like looking for a different uh, flavor of church. Maybe they move, they're looking for a different venue, whatever it is. But for some reason, these new church plants, they tend to draw in new believers, people who aren't already in churches. Uh, and they've done studies on that to show that that's, that's really true. So one of the practical reasons is just to reach new people uh, by starting new churches. Uh, I think the second one is really important. I hear a lot of times people kind of objecting to church planning and saying, well, there are a lot of churches out there already. Why wouldn't you, you know, go and strengthen those existing churches or strengthen those dying churches? Why would you just start a new one? Uh, and I think the research actually shows that by starting new churches, you're helping the existing churches in the area. Because when you start these new churches, A, you get those new converts that we talked about, right? Those new people who aren't already attending churches to kind of get excited and uh, being believing in Jesus. And sometimes those new converts aren't going to stay in the church that converted them, if that makes sense. So maybe they knew someone in their community who said, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus and tell you about the gospel. And so they learn this. But then when they try to go to that church, they realize, like, this isn't quite the right fit for me. Or, you know, maybe they move or whatever it is. And so you're actually bringing in new people to existing churches as well. Uh, and then other things is that it just sparks new ideas and it raises up new leaders. So it's kind of the idea of like, if you're on a team at work and you guys meet every week and you're always talking about the, the same issues and the same you know, problems that you're trying to solve, you kind of start to see it from one perspective. And so then say you bring in someone new to your team and they have all these fresh ideas and these different ways of looking at things and these questions that you're like, oh, I never thought about asking that. So it's kind of like that. These new churches that are popping up in the area can really spur on existing churches. Um, in a way that maybe they didn't have that excitement, they kind of lost the excitement, or they haven't thought about those new ideas yet. So, uh, just want to hold up, I do love the idea of strengthening existing churches. I'm not against that. I have a good friend who, who wants to do that for his ministry. That's what he wants to do. Um, instead of planning a church, he wants to go in and help existing churches. And I want to say that's an awesome thing. If you, if you feel called to that, or if that's what you're excited about, I am all for that. But I also want to say that by planting new churches, we're not ignoring the existing churches. We're not trying to say that we don't care about them or we want them to die off. So I think both are really important and can be really helpful to the community. Um, the third one is that it, it can reach the diversity of the city. So whatever city you're living in, we're in Minneapolis. Um, and I think the way that it does that is that church plans, and this might kind of get at the question someone asked on the today's meet about what's the difference between multi-location and church planting. Uh, church plants are going to have a different expression of the gospel. They're going to have a different culture. They're going to have a different feel than Hope does. So when they go out, they might reach a totally different group of people than what Hope is already doing. So Hope tends to draw in college students and young people. That's kind of our culture. That's who we're trying to reach. Uh, but, you know, you look at Grafted, which is in Northeast and is not that far away. Grafted's our most recent church plant. And they're reaching a different demographic. They're reaching a different group of people. And so uh, I think that that was one of the practical reasons that really hit me for church planning about how important it is. Um, because I realize and I look around, uh, I know a lot of friends who I think like, you should totally come to Hope. You should you know, join a church and be a part of our small group. And then when they get there, I realize this just isn't your thing. You know, like, they're not into the same uh, interests that a lot of people at Hope are. They don't feel like they connect. Maybe they don't like the humor or they don't like some, like, stylistic aspect of it. 
but they actually fit in really well at a different church. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, and I think that that's why church planning can be really important because it starts all these different expressions of the gospel and it reaches a lot of different uh, cultures or different groups of people. Um, and I saw this really clearly when we were at our assessment in Chicago. So there were six uh, other couples there who were from all different places over the country. We had some people from Colorado, from Kansas, some people from Chicago right there in the city. Uh, and as they started talking about their churches and sharing their visions for what they wanted to do, I found myself thinking, I would never want to go to that church. <laughs> like, I just would never fit in there. <laughs> Not that I didn't love the people or that I didn't think that they, you know, I could see they clearly believed in the gospel and they cared about people and they really wanted to make a difference, but I just thought, that's just not for me. It's not my style, it's not my thing. And yet I know that they're gonna be out there reaching lots of different people. Uh, one of the couples that was there, they're currently pastoring a church of like 70 year old women. So <laughs> I probably wouldn't fit in with a bunch of 70 year olds, but I'm really glad that someone is reaching them, right? And so I think just thinking about the difference that church plants can have is that they can reach these different cultures of these different groups of people. And that makes me really excited because I would love to be able to reach all of them all at once, but I just know that that's, that's just not possible. So I'm really thankful that there are other people out there who want to do that. Um, and I think along with the stylistic stuff, there's also different forms. And I uh, another quote from Center Church, and he says that, in the final analysis, I don't believe any single form of church small or large, cell group based or mid-sized community based, is intrinsically better at growing spiritual fruit, reaching non-believers, caring for people, and producing Christ-shaped lives. I say on the final analysis because each approach to church, the small, organic, simple, incarnational church, and the large, organizational, complex, attractional church, has vastly different strengths and weaknesses, limitations, and capabilities. So along with just the difference in style and culture, there's also a difference in form and function. So we're a big church at Hope. Uh, and some people, that's really hard for them to connect with. And that's something that they don't, um, they can't find community there. They don't seem to, it doesn't click for them. Whereas some people, the really small churches is not their thing either. And so this idea that neither one is better or worse, but that they're all equally important because they're reaching these different groups of people. So I think that's another aspect of um, kind of reaching the diversity of the city. Uh, and then the last thing is just that it plants more churches. And so that might sound kind of strange, but if you think about at Hope, we really value church planting. And so if we plant a church, hopefully that church will also really value church planting. And then down the line, that church that we planted might decide, hey, we want to plant a church. And then so you see how this kind of keeps going. And so uh, while we were at our assessment, one of the activities that they gave us to do was that they put us all in a room together and they said, we want to, you to come up with a strategy for planting 10 churches in 10 years. And so the thing that we ultimately came up with looked like this diagram, but it's the idea that if you plant churches that have the DNA or the vision for church planting, they'll hopefully go and plant more churches. And so it was cool to think about how by planting churches who want to plant more churches, you can accomplish uh, 10 churches in 10 years in a way that you probably couldn't have if you just went down one line of those, right? It would take a lot longer to plant all from just one single church um, or to have just that number one church plant 10 different <coughs> churches in a constellation around it. So just the practical fact that multiplication will happen. If you multiply, more things are going to keep happening. Um, so those are kind of the practical reasons of church planning. Uh, and I was going to give you guys a break, but I'm trying to kind of move through things a little quicker because we're uh, moving a little fast. So, uh, so yeah, I wanted to bring it home to get to this getting involved piece. I think this whole stream, we've talked a lot about church. We've talked a lot about um, what the mission of the church is, why we would plant churches, what does that look like? So I just wanted to bring it back to a little bit personal, more personal of a level for you guys. And so part of this is that, uh, have any of you guys heard of the four currents of hope? Mike, you don't count. <laughs> um, it's kind of a way, it's an analogy we use at hope uh, to talk about some of the things that are important to us. So we talk about it in terms of a river, 
Uh, and the currents are those things that kind of keep it moving towards a specific destination. And so at Hope, we've kind of condensed it into four different currents that we feel like we have in our metaphorical river. So if you guys had to guess what these four currents were, what would, you, what would be some of your guesses? Our middle name. Community, yep. Gospel and community is one of them. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's part of the gospel. Gospel and community. Church planting. Yeah, church planting is one of them. Um, New events. Yeah, so here we've got gospel and community, leadership development, gold stars for all of you to participating in that. Uh, Hope culture, that's kind of our catch-all for like that, that stylistic uh, thing that I was talking about. Everything. Yeah, <laughs> they call it, this is totally like a Steve language, calls it the goop that makes hope stick together. It's basically just our, you know, our culture. If you had to try and describe hope to someone, it's probably the things that you would, you would choose to say. Uh, and that last one is church planting. So if you're at Hope and you, you know, didn't know these, that's okay. But if you are saying, like, I'm part of this community and I, I have a, believe in the vision here and I want to be a part of it, part of that vision, a huge part of that vision is church planting. Um, and so I think personally for you guys just to know that and to uh, kind of catch the vision and be able to explain it and talk about it with other people is really important. Uh, and I think that... Of these four, besides the fact that whole culture is kind of a, a strange term, I think that church planning is probably the last one that a lot of us would have guessed. I know that before I joined staff at Hope, I I don't know that I would have gotten church planting out of that. And so I think just like being a part of this community it means being excited about church planting. It means catching that vision um, and wanting to support church plants and be a part of them. And even if you don't feel like you're called to go out with a church plan or to um, be like physically a part of that, I think just praying for them. Like Nathan said, prayer is huge, and it can be a really, really important part of uh, church planning and of ministry. Um, I also think just some of the, the more intangible things of, we tend to like the idea of church planning theoretically, but when it comes down to it, and when it comes down to like, oh, that means we're giving a large portion of our budget or of our money to church planning or oh that means that we are you know when the next church plant goes out we're losing people you know maybe those people are some of your friends or some of the leaders that you work with and to say I'm not going to think of this as a loss because they're leaving I'm going to think of it as a gain because church planning is so important and I'm excited that these people are going to be a part of it or maybe that you would even consider being a part of it yourself. So practically on the level of like, how do you feel about church planning or what do you think about it? I think just being informed about what church planning is and why we do it. And then, yeah, having that excitement or having catching that vision for um, why we do it and being excited about it is one practical way to do it. And I think uh, on the more practical like doing side of things, I think that we're all called to be a part of this in some way, um, whether that's like I said, it doesn't mean you have to go with a church plant, but having the excitement of reaching new people, um, evangelism and discipleship, and all of those things that go along in that Pauline cycle, I think that we're all called to be a part of that. Not just the leaders, not just the people who are self-selecting to church plant, but all of us as believers are part of that mission. Um, and in 2 Corinthians, these are some of my favorite verses, but it talks about, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, uh, that God was reconciling the world to, Christ, or to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Uh, and then it kind of gives a nice summary of the gospel and saying that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And I love these verses because it really does show how we all are involved in this, right? If we believe in the gospel, if we have been reconciled with uh, God through Christ, then we are Christ's ambassadors. 
Uh, and if you think about what the word ambassador means, it's this idea that you're representing someone, um, typically in a place that is not actually where you're from or where that person is. So the idea of if you're an ambassador from Rome, you're probably in a different city representing Rome or representing Rome's king, so to speak. And so this idea that, yeah, we aren't in heaven with God, we're not there right now, but we are uh, strangers in this land and that we're representing God. Uh, we are his representation. And that's a really big uh, responsibility. It's a big honor, but I also think it, it calls us to be involved in something, to be a part of that mission that God has uh, for the church. Um, and I think another verse that shows this well is 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So if you guys can think back to when we did the Old Testament and we talked about the temple and about kind of what the temple's role was, we talked a little bit about how back then there were only certain people who had access to God. Uh, and they had to do these certain things or be in these specific places in order to have that access. And now it's saying that you all are that, right? You are the chosen people, a royal priesthood. So not only does this have an impact on us for our personal relationship with God and that we can go to him at any time, but I also think it shows those priests and those people who had the access to God, they were kind of the leaders. They were the big, uh, the people leading the, the nation and leading in God's mission. And now it's saying, it's all of us. It's every single person who believes is now a part of that. And so I think just realizing that we have this personal responsibility and that not in a like, you have to go do this thing, uh, like a, a list of chores that you have to check off, but it's a, it's a really big honor. To be a priest was like a really big deal. And now it's saying, this is all of us. We've all been given that through Christ. Um, and you don't, wanna, you don't wanna take advantage of that. You don't wanna miss out on that. Um, and so I wanted to talk about an example that I see in Acts, again, of where I see this like playing out. Uh, and it's from Acts 17, verse 5 through 8. So I'll read it, and then I'll kind of talk through the, the context of it. But it says, But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jake, Jason, seeking to bring Paul and Silas out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. So I, I love the phrase that I put in bold there, that they've turned the world upside down. Uh, and the way that they did this, it says, is through saying that there is another king, Jesus. And so... These are just ordinary guys uh, that were living in the city, and they, they so believed in Jesus' authority and in Jesus as king that it transformed the way that they lived. And it made them stand out in the community, and it made them do things that looked different, that made other people think, whoa, they're turning the world upside down. Um, and if you read further in Acts, there, one of the ways that they did this, or one of the things that they're talking about, is that in this certain area, um, the silversmiths, the ones who used to like make idols, were going out of business because the people in that community were no longer buying idols because they were so transformed by Jesus and they were following his authority rather than you know the authority of culture that they're actually changing the economy of the city, which is crazy. Uh, and I just love that this is these are the ordinary people. And that their lives are so transformed that it starts to, it creates a movement, it turns the whole world upside down. And I just think about what could that look like for us? Uh, what if our community in, uh, in the Twin Cities, we were so transformed by Jesus and by following his authority that we, you know, put the pornography business out of, or we put it out of business, or we stopped, um, I'm trying to think of another example off the top of my head, but We've changed so much the economy that things in the world started to change. Things in the city started to change. 
And I think that I love it that it's these people who are just like us, who could do that. It's the normal people. Um, and so I think these are the verses that really show me that there is something that we can do practically. This isn't just out there. It's for those people who decide to go be missionaries. It's for those people who decide to church plant. But this is for all of us. And that uh, there's a difference that we can make in this. And so uh, one of the quotes that I found from in talking about evangelism in the early church and what that looks like for people was that it said that having found treasure, they meant to share with others to the limits of their ability. And so I think a lot of times we like to think about these big ideals of changing the world and making a difference and think, that just sounds too hard. Uh, it sounds too far out there. It's not for me. Um, and I love the way that this guy talks about it is that it was so simple that it was just so transformed them that they felt this need to share it with other people. They couldn't hold it back. They had found treasure and they so badly wanted to share it with other people. Uh, and they did it in simple ways. So it wasn't that they all decided to go out and they converted a ton of people on the spot, but it was through their, their relationships that they had. It was through their everyday interactions in the city and in the marketplace and in, in the world. Um, I have another quote in here. Yep, so it's, it's this is on the idea of like the role of relationships and how that plays into evangelism. And it's taken from a book called Souls in Transition, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of Emerging Adults. He's a sociologist who writes kind of about young adults and religion and how they interact with it. But it says that one thing is certain sociologically, operating at the heart of both personal and religious stability and change are the crucial matter of significant personal relationships, both those that affirm and bind and those that break down and set loose. Rarely do people's thinking and feeling and behaving change dramatically or stay the same without significant social relationships exerting pressures to do so and facilitating these outcomes. Significant personal relationships may not be the heart of religious life itself, but they certainly provide the bones and other muscles within which the heart of religion beats. So just this idea that these people, when they, you know, they found treasure and they wanted to share it with others, wasn't well, like they were preaching to huge crowds, but they just went to their neighbor and they're like, hey, I just heard this thing and I, I need to share it with you. Um, and the idea that most religious change in people, especially in young adults, which uh, kind of fits the <laughs> demographic here, hope, happens through personal relationships. And so thinking through what can we do in that? And I, if you didn't get to do the reading for Center Church uh, for this session, I would highly recommend looking through, I think it's chapter 21, it's the last chapter that's assigned there, because Tim Keller goes through and he gives this huge list of ways that you can go, you can think about doing evangelism. Um, and a lot of them just have to do with basic personal relationships. You know, things like going for a walk in your neighborhood at the same time every day so that you can meet your neighbors. Or, you know, just telling your coworkers that you, were, you went to church this weekend. Um, just really simple steps that are ways that you can help build that personal relationship with people and eventually build up to sharing the gospel with them. I think it can be really easy to think like, if I'm evangelizing, that means I'm, I'm sharing the gospel, I'm you know, sharing the four spiritual laws or the, the KGP or whatever it is, those tracks. Like I'm going through the whole thing and then we pray and they made a decision and now they're going to start coming to church with me. And I think when we don't do that, we feel like, uh, I'm not doing anything, so I'm just going to give up. And there's this whole middle ground in between of building relationships with people and working through that with them that I think we tend to miss because we just see the two extremes. Uh, and Keller does a, a great job of talking about that. He uses this term that he calls relational integrity. Uh, and the three pieces of relational integrity, he says that you have to be like the culture or like people. You have to be unlike them, and you have to be engaged with them. Um, so the quote here says, we will have an impact for the gospel if we are like those around us, and yet profoundly different and unlike them at the same time, all the while remaining very visible and engaged. And so we see that in that act story, right? That they're, they're like the culture, they're living in that world, and yet they're unlike them in the way that they spend their money or in the way that they live their lives and yet they're still engaged. They haven't separated themselves from the rest of the world as they do this. And that's what really made an impact. That's what turned the world upside down. Um, 
And so I, I think this is a really cool thing to think through, especially in terms of our relationships with either our coworkers or our neighbors or our family, uh, whoever those people are. Uh, how are you like them? How are you uh, engaging with them in their interests or in the fact that you both work at the same place or you live in the same neighborhood? How are you showing that there's similarity between you and them? I think that really builds trust with people. But at the same time, how are you showing them that you're different? How are you showing that because you live under, you know, that Acts passage talks about Jesus as their king, that because you believe in, in the gospel, that your life is different? Whether that means, like, yeah, you say, yeah, I went to church this weekend, or whether it's shown in the, the way that you decide to not engage in gossip at work, or how you decide to make a decision based on integrity versus just based on what's best for you in that moment. So showing them that you're different while at the same time being like them. And then the third thing is just being engaged. And I think that because those first two are, it's a really hard tension to keep. I think we tend to swing one side or the other. We try to be so like them that we kind of hide the other parts of us, ourselves that don't fit in, or we try to show them so much that we're different and that Jesus is different that we kind of uh, make them feel uncomfortable or we ostracize them. Uh, and so when that happens, I think we just disengage. We say, this is too hard, I don't know how to do this, I'm just gonna go hang out with my Christian friends and not worry about it. And I think that while we're always gonna struggle with that like and unlike tension, we're probably never gonna get it perfectly right. The biggest thing that we have to keep in mind is just how do we stay engaged? How do we, how do we keep coming back even when it's uncomfortable? Um, and so a story that I had when I thought about my personal life and how I had seen this done well or done poorly, made me think of my friend Laura from college. So uh, when I went to college, I was kind of picking up some of the story I told you guys at the retreat about my life, but when I went to college, I wasn't really sure whether or not I was like all in on this faith thing and how involved I wanted to be. And so uh, Laura actually made a huge impact and uh, pushed me towards the direction of getting involved in the church. And she did it through a really simple thing in personal relationships. So the story was that it was Welcome Week at the U of M. Any of you guys have to experience Welcome Week at the U of M? You remember how awful it was? <laughs> uh, it's basically this week where they have all the freshmen come in before everybody else, and they just pack it full of activities. And they just try to make you like socialize with everybody in your hall and to experience every single thing that's out there. At least they did my year. I hope that they've changed it. But it was welcome week and we finally had some time off. And so I was sitting in my room and Laura lived in the room next door to me. And I'd met her the day before, talked to her a little bit. So I hardly knew her. And she took a step and walked into my room, which everyone leaves their door open the first week. but it's still hard to walk into a room of, with strangers. I mean, it's hard to take that step and say, I'm gonna walk in there and say hi and introduce myself. And she asked me to come with her to this like uh, activities fair. So it was just this big, huge uh, expo where they had all these booths set up with all the different activities that were at the U of M. And she kind of, you know, she bonded with me by saying like, yeah, this Welcome Week stuff is crazy. You know, she showed that we were similar and that we were both in the same boat, that we were like each other. Um, but then, you know, took the step to be unlike and said, hey, do you want to come with me? And so we went, and as we're walking around, she just said, like, you know, there's this Christian group that I kind of want to check out. So if we see it, you know, I'm going to stop. Like, you can come with me if you want. So she took that step to say, I'm unlike you, you know, we both want to do this, we're both here at the U of M, but I'm going to show you my interest, and I'm just going to throw that out there. And I, at that, like I said, at that point, I could have gone either way, if I wanted to get involved in, in Christian life or not. And because she just asked me, I said, sure. And I, I went along, and I met some people. We got into a Bible study in our floor, and eventually we came to Hope. And so just this very simple thing of her saying, hey, do you want to go to the activities fair with me? ended up having a huge impact in my faith. I probably wouldn't be here. Uh, I mean, I'm sure God could have made it happen some other way, but he used Laura just walking into my room to ask me that simple question. Um, and I, I think that's that staying engaged piece, right? She could have gone on her own. She could have called up some of her friends from high school that also went to the U of M. But she said, I'm going to stay engaged in the community that I'm in, and I'm going to take that step. And I, I look back and I think, 
wow. <laughs> that must have felt really vulnerable in that moment. You're putting yourself in a place of being rejected. My roommate and I could have said, like, no, that's lame. We're not going. Get out of our room. <laughs> but we didn't. And uh, I think she took that step without being run over by the fear of rejection. Um, she let her belief in Christ and her belief in what that meant to her uh, cause her to take that step. And so I think my, my encouragement for all of you would be just to think through in those moments when you're kind of like, oh, I could make the time to say hi to my neighbor, or you know, I could go eat lunch with that coworker, uh, but I don't know, I don't really want to, or maybe they don't want me to, maybe they don't want to hear from me, or they don't want another person talking to them, to just remember that sometimes it's those really simple steps that can make a difference. And I bet if a lot of you thought back on your own story, you can think of someone or something that had an impact like that in your life. Um, so, as we wrap up, I just kind of want to walk through some of the objectives from this stream. So this is the, the last three sessions that we've had. The objectives have been uh, in the area of biblical thinking to better understand how and why the church was formed and what role it plays in the storyline of Christianity. Uh, in character, we wanted to increase our love and appreciation for the church and its members and to increase our desire to live out our giftings by faithfully serving in the church and in the city. And in ministry skills, we wanted to grow in the way we communicate the gospel, engage with culture, and organize our ministry efforts. And so I hope that this last stream has been, you've seen growth in those areas in your life. Um, and as we wrap up, these are kind of my questions I want you to think about uh, in terms of those three pillars. So for biblical thinking, you know, do you understand the vision of the church? Do you understand a vision for church planting specifically? And could you explain it to somebody else? Could you go to specific passages in the Bible that talk about the church and know where they are and be able to talk about them with someone else? Uh, in terms of ministry skills or, or character, sorry, is the second one. Do you know where you fit within the church? Um, do you know what your specific giftings are and how you would use those gifts? So like we talked about earlier, Nathan is called to, feels called to global church planning and to missions and not plans. And Egg called to local church planning. Do you know where your fit is in that mission? Do you feel like you have an understanding of where God's placed you in time and in your location right now and how you might be being called to use your gifts in that area? Uh, and then the last thing is just how can you grow in relational integrity? Um, that last objective was how do you better communicate the gospel and engage with culture? So uh, where do you need to grow in being like the culture that you're in? Where do you need to grow in being unlike them? And how can you stay engaged with them? How can you take those steps uh, to be engaged with the people around you? So all of those questions, I think all of them are in our um, handout for the last, for your last cohort meeting. So I'm gonna kind of transition into announcements. And if you guys did have questions, I didn't get a chance to look at the today's meet, but I'll post them on the city if you did. Um, but I do have our last handout of the year with the reflection questions, which means we do expect you guys to meet one more time as a cohort. Um, you can use this time to reflect uh, and talk through these questions. Um, or you could do something fun with your cohort too. Uh, the LDI 5K is coming up this Saturday, so if you are a runner or if you want to walk, like I will be walking, uh, you can attend the 5K with your cohort. That could be a really great way to get them. Uh, a few last announcements are that we want you to turn in those surveys in the back if you finished yours. Um, and if you are still unsure about next year, like I said, the deadline is June 30th. So if you haven't given us an answer, we'll be reaching out to you to ask what your plans are for the next year. But if you could just keep that in mind uh, as you think about it. And lastly, uh, Ben just wanted me to reiterate, if you have other thoughts that you didn't get to be able to put on the survey, just reach out to us. We'd love to talk about it. We're always looking for ways to make this program better. So um, don't be strangers. You can email us. So thank you guys so much. This has been such a fun year to get to know all of you and to work with you. Um, I hope that these uh, last 10 months have been edifying for you too, especially in the three pillars. That's our prayer for you guys is that you would be growing in those areas and that God would be working in your life. So thanks so much for being a part of it. If you guys have questions or anything else, feel free to contact us. But I'm going to make one more announcement. I thank okay. Julie here. This has been four years of, uh, in the process of Ben Reeves. was uh, one of the first uh, guys. I think some of you have done this for 
for a while, but Julie has been a backbone for this uh, ministry, so I want to give her a hand here. So Thank you. I tried to tell Benji I was going to publicly thank him earlier, and he told me I wasn't allowed to. But still can't. Give a hand for Benji. 